Yep. Okie dokie. Let me see. So people joining right now will uh, begin in a few minutes. So hold on a little bit. Okay, I think we can slowly start uh, our event today. So hello everyone. Um, my name is Martha and I'm part of Seoul Startups, Korea's biggest international startup community. We are gathered here today to have an amazing panel discussion with some really extraordinary people about how to survive as a startup, as a tech company in this COVID-19 era. Um, what is Seoul Startups, you may ask, if you haven't been our member before. We are uh, a community of fun-loving uh, professionalists uh, who are either working, connected to the Korean startup scene, or want to be connected to the startup scene. And we help uh, create value by connecting people, institutions, and creating amazing events and experiences for anyone who wants to be part of the global startup scene here in Korea. We have over 1,200 members and we're growing day by day. Uh, we've had some really cool events, uh, offline events last year, but now because of COVID, we've moved online and we are also having a great time. We are powered by a team of really talented and amazing professionalists here on the Korean startup scene who are putting all their passion and effort to make sure that the best experiences come to you. So if you're not a member, please do go to uh, soulstartups.com and join our online Slack community. But forget about me, forget about Soul Startups. We're here today to celebrate some very great people. Um, uh, here are our, our amazing panelists, Norbert representing Tokyo Fintech, Klaus representing German Accelerator, and Jordan representing number two. I think it's number two or two squared. Um, we will start with each of them introducing themselves. So I would like to ask Norbert to tell us about yourself and your amazing organization. Thank you, Martha. Um, so my name is Norbert. I'm German, uh, but I spent the last 25 years outside, uh, essentially split between New York and Tokyo. I spent more of my career in capital markets. I worked for Goldman Sachs and Barclays and as a consultant and primarily have built and delivered front to back trading infrastructures and built a number of greenfield broker dealers in Beijing, in China, in Brazil, built a bank in Korea, actually, that was 2006, I think, uh, one of the, the more fun projects. Um, so we split time, we came back to Japan in 2017, 
which is when I created Tokyo FinTech. And the idea behind this is very basic. When you drive innovation and transformation in a big financial services organization, many of the obstacles you face are actually human. And the most difficult thing to scale is the learning aspect. So if people don't understand what you're trying to do, then you're banging your head against the wall and you will invariably fail. And we've taken this now to the Tokyo or the national level. And what we want to contribute to with Tokyo FinTech is largely educating on the art of the possible in terms of new technologies and business models. We build a community and we'll feel very much associated with soul startups in spirit, right? So we, we're coming out of the, the same origin from that perspective. Our community is now 3,200 members. Um, and ultimately all of this should move towards helping innovation in the financial services sector in Japan. We're registered as a not-for-profit, so this is also all on our personal time. Uh, we'd like to thank Deloitte for sponsoring us over the last two years and covering the operating cost and other great partners. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you, Martha. Well, I, I forgot to add the most important thing is that the Tokyo FinTech is an amazing partner of Seoul Startups, a community partner. So we're really, really delighted to, to be partnered with you and to have something cooking in, uh, starting with this podcast and hopefully more to come. Next to follow is another, uh, well, Norbert is from Germany, talking of which a German accelerator and Klaus who has a really amazing presentation about his organization. So on to you, Klaus. Unmuting helps, the first lesson of every webinar. Uh, great, to, great to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Marta, and happy to see some faces I know. Quick story about myself. I'm also German. <clears throat> I've been in, in Asia for about 27, 28 years now. Um, I also lived in New York. I, uh, I moved to New York when I was 15 years old, grew up in the States, uh, came later back to Germany, and, and basically then I moved out to Asia with some steps in the middle. Uh, I'm a technologist by heart, right? So I used to develop satellite systems and, and sort of hardcore stuff and um, worked with large corporates similar to Norbert. Uh, decided to go on my own 20 years ago. So I started my first startup in 1999, which is still in existence today. And since then, I basically created 10 uh, companies um, in different aspects of it, right? I mean, different technologies and so on. And um, I basically am part or run the German Accelerator in Southeast Asia, which is an organization I want to introduce briefly. Can you flip to the slides? Maybe slide number four or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, so basically, we are lucky in a sense that our organization, um, we are also a nonprofit foundation, actually, in Germany. Um, we get money from high net worth individuals and we get money from the German government. And we are very lucky that we can spend that money on startups. When you go to the next slide, um, you can see we worked um, um, with quite a number of companies. We actually have three unicorns in that cohort by now. Um, so we work globally, and that maybe goes to the next slide. <clears throat> so we, we started in Silicon Valley um, about uh, 10 years ago, um, moved to New York to basically have a broader view on the United States ecosystem. We created our first vertical accelerator, which is uh, in, in Boston um, with MIT, where we basically look at larger series DEF uh, life sciences companies coming out of Germany and, and who are going for uh, American FDA approvals, et cetera. Then in 2017, we decided to create the German accelerator in Southeast Asia. You see our blip here in Singapore. And you see also a few other spots, uh, one of them being Korea and uh, Japan and India. So Korea very much is an interest market uh, for us and Japan as well. Um, we have um, 
a lot of government, uh, you can go to the next slide, yeah. Um, we have a lot of government relationships, not because we are government, but uh, we, we also know in Asia, government uh, can be quite instrumental, regulators, um, you know, knowing the right people. Um, so we try to work across all governments. Um, for instance, in Japan, we, we have Jetro and so on. I mean, you all know that. In Korea, we're just starting. We're very happy also that we found you, Marta. And we have our next program coming, which is called Next Step, as the name indicates. Next Step is a market um, immersion program where we introduce new markets uh, to German startups and SMEs. It's not only sort of limited to startups, but also SMEs. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, you see for us, South Korea is of interest. Japan is of interest. Why is that? Um, both markets have very um, comparable uh, technology requirements uh, than Germany. So obviously one of our interests is to bring good German startups in robotics or, or so on to, to out to Korea, to Japan. But likewise, we, we bring um, Asian startups to Germany. So we are not only a one-way street, we also bring Asian startups to Europe in the wider sense. Um, so we run programs with uh, Japan, we run programs with Singapore uh, at the moment where we bring around 20 to 30 startups per year into the German market for a market entry program, right? So we help them with local mentoring and getting their POCs and the usual thing what the accelerator does. So now in South Korea, when you go to the next slide, we, we basically just uh, are starting. So we are very happy to find partners we can work with and, and it's our interest basically to have a lasting relationship. So it is not just a one-time event that we come to Korea. So it's, it's on our map um, and uh, that will hopefully bring us together in person soon. So thank you for having me on this webinar and uh, I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Marta. Okay, thank you, Klaus. Amazing. And, and I've, it's amazing to have such a renowned accelerator tapping into the Korean market. And Seoul Startups is more than happy to welcome new cohorts of German startups that want to be part of our happy and delightful community because our goal is to help uh, entrepreneurs feel at home here as much as possible. One of those entrepreneurs is Jordan, representing the French. I think I'm going to butcher the name, number two. Uh, Jordan, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, first of all, uh, th thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's great to, uh, to learn about what you guys are doing. It's actually quite amazing to see the communities and, and acceleration uh, institutions that you're creating. It's really, really nice. Uh, so I am French indeed. Um, our company, actually, we call it NR2. Uh, but anything works as long as um, people are talking about it. I'm happy. Uh, so, so basically, I mean, I, I uh, yeah. So we we started out in French. Actually, uh, our company was uh, thought through when we were living in China. So I was living in China in the past, and uh, what we've done uh, very quickly is that we created a search engine that allows anybody to find innovative startups uh, from China. Uh, so if you go on nr2.io, you will see that it looks like Google and you can type in whatever you want. Uh, if you type in AI FinTech, for example, you'll see uh, all of the companies that exist currently in China that are innovating in this, uh, in this, um, in this area. Uh, what we've done is we've actually created a specific algorithm to rank these companies. So the way it's done is that you can think of that as uh, the equivalent of what stock prices would be for public companies but for private companies. So you, you have the companies ranked uh, based off of uh, what investors think uh, in terms of how prom promising they could be. So, um, so that's what we do. Uh, and we started out with China, which is one of the biggest ecosystems in the world. And now we decided to expand to South Korea. Uh, I arrived here in Seoul uh, in August of last year through a program called the K-Star Grand Challenge. It's a global program where they invite companies from all over the world to try and attack the market. We went through that um, and we decided to stay. So now I'm, I'm based here in Seoul. We're expanding our search engine to uh, South Korea and we hope soon to all of Asia. 
the reason why we're taking our time to do that is because in order to have the most reliable information on startups, which are quite difficult ecosystems to understand, we have to create algorithms in the local languages. So our algorithms are currently all in Chinese. This is why we have uh, so much data on China and we're now adapting them to Korean so we can actually see everything that happens in Korea. And, um, and yeah, that's it. So thank you very much for having me and looking forward to this Wow, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jordan. And uh, yeah, like it's awesome to have uh, such a prominent startup tap into the Korean scene as well and to have you on board uh, with our community. Um, so we will now continue to actually uh, talking and discussing a very important question or very important questions to do with what the startup scene here in Korea, uh, in, in Asia is doing, what is happening in the, the post COVID or current COVID Asian startup scene and how we can uh, work, overcome different difficulties that we have been experiencing. So uh, without further ado, um, hold on a second. Uh, I would like to open the discussion with the question first to kind of both of you, or all, all of you, which is a bit of a personal question. That is, how is your company or organization currently dealing with, uh, with the COVID-19 situation? Has anything influenced the way you operate? Are, have you, are you operating differently? Or is it business as usual? And if so, why have you been prepared before? So I would like to start with, uh, uh, with Jordan because he's the startup representative here. So wh wh what is it like, first of all, being a startup in Korea during COVID-19, Jordan? Yeah, so I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's actually very interesting. So. Uh, b before I answer, I I'll just tell you how we work I I at NR2 because uh, I think we we're quite specific in a way. So um, because we're trying to be a bridge between Europe and Asia and, and try to link these ecosystems together, uh, which is, I feel like, uh, what a lot of people are doing here, which is awesome and I really like that, um, it means that our team is actually working remotely a lot, even uh, before COVID-19. So. We have team members in the UK, we have some in France, in China, in South Korea. So uh, we are actually used to working um, remotely. So that's just as an introduction. Now, in terms of the very specifics, the reality is even though we're working remotely, uh, we see that um, there is definitely an impact on, 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 on the team because uh, uh, especially those who are in Europe or were in China during the during the outbreak in China, because the fact that you are actually stuck at home, even though you can still work uh, as usual for us, still you have it has an impact on you personally and how you engage with life, which I think is something that everybody's going through right now, especially people with uh, with kids. Now, uh, specifically in South Korea, uh, we didn't have a quarantine here, so that means that this emotional pressure is uh, very different. We don't feel it the same way. I know that in March, we had some kind of an outbreak where people were starting to get worried in South Korea. But even then, because we had masks, everybody were wearing masks outside and everybody was very careful, uh, you could still go outside. And even though you couldn't go uh, to a club, you could just uh, go and walk near a lake. So that means that um, I would say psychologically and emotionally, uh, Korea is actually, it's, it's, it's very easy to go through that because uh, you, you can go outside and have an almost normal life. Uh, I have a lot to say, but I feel like uh, uh, it would be good to, um, to hear uh, other experiences. Um, but, but in summary, yeah, I think it changed, it changed a lot of things. Um, and in South Korea, I think we're quite lucky actually because of the way it's handled here. Uh, and, and technology is a big part of it, by the way, just before I, I pass on, I'd like to say that. So I don't know if you guys are aware, but uh, in South Korea, we have a map like Google Maps, uh, it's called Kakao Map or Never Map. And on these maps, you can see where masks are available uh, in premises in real time, which means that technology is actually part of how you handle life here and it makes it easier. So, yeah, I think it's, um, it's, it's I, I feel like it was a bit easier in, in, in South Korea. 
Awesome. Yeah. Well, I can relate to that because um, we're also based <laughs> same city. Uh, but how is it literally across uh, the sea in Japan? So what, uh, Norbert, what is it, what does the situation look for Japan tech com uh, companies and specifically the companies in your community, fintech companies? Has anything changed when it comes to working in the business uh, way of doing things? Yeah, I mean, first of all, Japan is probably an, an import destination for uh, startups. So we're, we're attracting more startups and we're exporting. And clearly the, the personal interaction has been shut down completely. So you still can't travel to Japan from most countries. And that has a good side and a bad side. So it's clear that anything we've done in the event space and helping companies physically on the ground to get connected here, uh, that has come to a complete stop. On the other side, um, interactions have increased, I would say, at the digital level. And uh, I think it's for all of us uh, the same. And the, in the intensity of the, the working day has increased, right? Because your the, the natural breaks that you have by crisscrossing the city and going from one client to the other and spending half an hour in the taxi or in the subway, um, has been eliminated and you've got 12 hours back to back to back Zoom calls. Um, so the the accessibility is actually there. I'm absolutely amazed and this is um, a, a typical Japanese thing in a way where maybe for a long time nothing changes and then suddenly everything switches completely that some of the traditional, what you would consider traditional a Japanese financial services player like Sampo, which is one of the big three insurers, for example, they switched to working from home basically from one day to the next. And although the state of emergency has been lifted, uh, they will continue working from home for a, a little while. And so that's quite amazing when you when you know the Japanese working culture and how much face time actually used to mean. Um, and in a way, I don't want to be cynical, but the, the crisis has been maybe a bit too short. So I'm not entirely confident that this behavior will stick. And there's, there's there always a risk that people flip back to uh, their, their old ways. But what we see as green shoots in terms of what is possible when uh, you create flexibility. And I think it's truly about flexibility. It's not black and white. We don't want to work 100% in the office. We don't want to work 100% from home, but give people the flexibility to shape their life based on their individual needs and make that work in the greater community that is their team or their the company, right? That would be a complete mind shift here in Japan. And we're, we're seeing very good signs of that possibly happening. Wow. Well, thank thank you so much. In a, in a way, similar to Korea, but different as well. And it's really interesting to see that countries so close have shared a bit of a different approach to um, dealing with the situation and being on, on top of things or not being on top of things. Um, Klaus, you represent an organization that kind of spans around the world and has representation in all the countries, but gathers primarily German startups. So how have the uh, companies in your co cohorts and your portfolios have been dealing with uh, with what has been going on in the world, uh, especially in different geographical regions? I mean, for, for us, uh, this has been a shock to the system. Um, we are, we are um, if you so want, a consulting company at the end of the day, and we are used to face-to-face -face engagements. We have co-working spaces and all these different places. We're used to have startups with us. We work with them. We work with founders and so on, hands-on. We have our mentor pool. They come to our places, right? So we're, we are a, an organization which is very driven by physical place, actually. Right, or we were, I have to say we were. So when, when the situation kicked in and, and suddenly we were faced with all this situation like everybody else, right? We basically relatively fast managed to put our, our workshops and everything we do, the whole programs online. 
um, the startups moved along, right? So we didn't lose startups um, at all, right? So they, they basically, some programs, they moved from physical engagement to next day online engagements, right? Others started online. We run uh, Lean Canvas workshops and all things online, right? So a lot of it has worked for us. Um, for our staff, I think, and, and maybe this is true for all of us, right? It, it has been very stressful. Um, some people, they live at home, they couldn't go out because of the lockdown rules. Like in Singapore, our office is still closed. Um, so it has been very difficult for, for our staff, right, to, to basically work work on all these different dimensions. There's a lot more coordination um, when you deal with an online environment where, where you have to deal with individuals, you can't squeeze as much in an hour and all of these things what we all learned in the past many weeks or months already, right? But all in all, I think our experience has been positive. Even working with um, partner organizations, we work also with a few uh, larger organizations like I mean the German car industry and so on so we we didn't see a massive drop I mean what we have seen is less interest in investments um, that is something we have noticed uh, everywhere I think there is uh, less interest in POCs right which is hard for startups so we we see this but I I wouldn't say it is related to a general loss of interest in innovation or in the startup world it's really that like every large organization, they also need to manage their own uh, changes and, and they need time to basically do what they need to do, just like, like we were required to change, right? I mean, we are relatively small, even if we're a global organization. So for us, it was um, a relatively fast move. And like maybe one more sentence. Our experience was that the cadence is actually very high. So a lot of uh, startups, when they said they participate, they come, right? We, we didn't have any issues with any of it, but I think this is also somewhat related because companies didn't have other choices. Um, if I'm confined at home, I have the whole day to go online and maybe participate in, in uh, virtual acceleration or whatever I do. I, I wonder how this world will look like when suddenly economies like in Korea are open again, people go back to the office, you have sales calls again, and, and basically online is competing with the offline world, um, how, how it will look like. So for us, the future is, um, I think we will go back to the physical world, um, not completely. I think we will keep some online content and so on, but we will definitely go back to a physical engagement. Yeah. Well, if, if I can answer about the Korean uh, scene is that, yes, we may be back to physical world or we were always in the physical world, but uh, because the rest of the world isn't, that is kind of forcing us to also be adapting new virtual tools. And that tapping into that, I kind of would like to go back to you, Klaus, and ask you specifically about the startups in uh, you, the region, I guess Southeast Asia is mostly the region that you're more mostly expertise in uh what was the how has the initial shock of the COVID lockdown uh, affected the startups especially early stage startups uh, in your region well what we have seen and and obviously we we work with the founders as i said right we um we have seen that the first thing is we told them to basically tighten the ship right i mean um you need to preserve cash, right? You, you need to be very careful uh, how, you, how you maneuver, right? You want to be true and honest to your team, right? I mean, you have to give them a future perspective, but at the same time, you need to be honest that it's tough and maybe we need to cut salaries to, in order to keep everyone going. So what we did is we basically went into crisis mode with, with all of our startups. We 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 have retired CFOs who, who we would put on task basically to work with startups. We had a few startups, um, they were in the middle of found, funding rounds. Um, they still managed to get the money, right? So in, in our case, I mean, it seemed like they were quite um, successful and, and lucky. Uh, we encouraged the startups to think of their clients, right? I mean, what, what baffled me the most as an, as an individual, right? Like, like all of us, all of you, 
I'm a subscriber to many different services from airlines to hotels to whatnot, right, to internet and anything. But basically, I hardly heard from any of my service providers about um, dear German Accelerator, dear Mr. Carter, you know, we are here for you. Can we help you? Right. I heard nothing. Right. I'm a I'm a customer to so many organizations and I heard nothing. So what we did is we encouraged all of our startups to go out, talk to their specific clients, um, ask them what they need, try to understand, you know, there the cheese has moved for your client. So how do you need to move around that you can sort of make sense out of that situation and, and not get lost in it, right? So it's a, we are very high touch uh, organization when we work with startups and basically that's what we did. Um, the cheese has moved for everyone. Um, but having said that, um, our intake, uh, we just took another batch on, um, has grown, right? So there, there doesn't seem to be like a, a thought, oh my God, you know, the future, there's no future, right? So I think everybody thinks there is a future. Let's roll up the sleeves and let's go, right? I mean, this is, this is generally speaking what we see, right? We just onboarded 26 startups across our locations. Um, so so I, everything is, is good what we can see there. Wow, that's uh, that's some really thoughtful and food for thought. Um, tapping into uh, you, Norbert, how is it going on, in, not only in, in Tokyo and Japan, but in the fintech market in general? Because I've actually read that you guys are doing pretty well, all things considered. Is it true or was it just a clickbait bait title that I came across? No, I think there are certainly aspects of that. And if you look at the US and Europe, for example, when it goes about uh, dispersing this, the subsidy, the support money during the crisis, right in the US, uh, Stripe and PayPal were engaged in distributing the funds. Uh, there were certainly startups in the UK that have done a pivot and uh, adjusted their business in, in a very short time frame, which they can because they're entirely digital. Uh, compared to the legacy banks to help the government distribute funds there as well. I don't know what the situation is in, in Germany. In Japan, unfortunately, uh, this has gone the traditional way and uh, little known fact, I think, that Entity Data was engaged to build a, a website to distribute this 100,000 yen, about $1,000 that every a resident here gets and the, the website was a disaster, um, which is not surprising, but uh, it, it, it's a bit of a wasted opportunity to give this work to a digital, pure digital startup that knows what they're doing, help them grow uh, through the crisis and play a role in solving the crisis. So uh, unfortunately, we're back to kind of the bad behaviors. I think going back to the macro view right uh, people clearly have been hesitant to use cash so in many countries uh, there's been a uh, move to cashless payments much more and, and even contactless payments um, there were articles that the atm network in the uk um, is rather stressed because hardly anybody wants to go to the atm push the buttons and get money out. So the level of activity actually reduced so much that they can't cover their operating costs anymore. Um, and so, so generally you see, I think, a much more shift to uh, digital financial services where it hasn't happened so, so far. Clearly European Nordic countries, Sweden is like 95% cashless. There's not much more that you can do, but in, in every other market, this will certainly be a catalyst towards moving that way. And that, that also includes Japan, right? We're very, still very traditional, especially in the services sector. We have personal and corporate seals, a hanko, so you stamp documents. And if you're trying to work from home, but you actually need to send somebody into the office to physically stamp paper to get, keep the business going, uh, I think, the real realization has set in that there 
better ways in 2020 to deal with this. And the legal framework is actually there for it. So uh, companies like DocuSign have been in Japan for 10 years, for example. Um, there, there's some debate as to if you get into a legal conflict, what type of evidence does the court actually accept and would they right, fully rely on, an, on purely a digital signature? But otherwise, again, I think good catalyst, use, never let a good crisis get un, unused. So take advantage of this and now drive digitization forward. And then there's a huge opportunity for all fintech startups that survive this drought, which no doubt we will have, right? There's um, POC timelines with incumbent institution take a long time. And so you, you add six or nine months through that with the crisis. So you need to hunker down, work on your product, um, think whether there's a certain angle where you can help the crisis. But otherwise, I would just repeat everything that Klaus said in terms of tightening the belts and seeing this through. I think once you come through these dark times, there's actually a very bright future at the other end. Right, so with every crisis, there comes an opportunity, but it also requires discipline and uh, responsibility from the startups. Jordan, uh, what about Korea? Because everybody's been singing praises about how Korea handled the actual health hazard of the COVID-19. But what about the startups? How, from your perspective, how have they been fending with what's been going on and how have the institutions here in Korea been helping them uh, along the way? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 b b before I start, I'd like to um, uh, just come back to one point that was uh, mentioned by Klaus, and I, I wish you'd be a, a, a subscriber to our service because uh, we've reached out to, our, to everybody who subscribed. Uh, and actually, it's very interesting because um, what we saw, so as I said, we're a search engine which is mostly uh, specialized in finding South Korean and Chinese companies. And as it happened, uh, China went through the crisis before everybody else. And they've taken a lot of measures. And so, uh, actually, what we've done when uh, when this happened, uh, we we upgraded our algorithm so that they could find all of the products that were used in China and proven useful to fight the virus. And uh, and then we have communicated that to uh, a lot of people. Uh, and we found actually that a lot of people were very active in trying to researching these products. Uh, and actually, it's one of the most searched terms uh, on our search engine right now, which also gives you ways to contact all these people who are working on these things in China. Um, and then something that we've also done, so I actually write a weekly newsletter uh, where I talk about everything that happens in, in China in terms of innovation. And in this newsletter, I'm trying to, um, I have been trying to explain and show through data what was actually happening and, and what it meant for startups and other companies. And that relates to your question, Marta, where I think that what's very interesting with the crisis that, that we see is, I think it's, it's very different from a financial crisis in as much as in the past, when you thought about a financial crisis, then the entire world is just, uh, is just suffering. And uh, even though everybody is suffering today, business-wise, what's happening is uh, some companies are actually striving through this crisis because of the way they work and their business model. And if you look at actually the data, and it's very, very, uh, it's very true in China with, for example, live stream sales companies, or all of these companies who had already uh, digital business models, they actually are having increasing sales and very, very good numbers. FinTech, uh, as said by Norbert, is, is, is a very good example where there's a lot of companies who are striving thanks to these uh, crisis. So I think what we're seeing is, uh, a change of paradigm. It's like a paradigm shift where something was already happening in the world and it was going at a certain pace. And because of this crisis, what's happening is this change is just uh, a lot faster now and we're forced into the change. Uh, everybody using Zoom, everybody using that. It was something that, for example, us, we used all the time. And now what happens is everybody uses it. And so it's very interesting to think about this and South Korea is a very good example of that. As I said, this, uh, this, this map from feature where you get access to livestock of masks in pharmacies uh, on your phone is a very good example where 
technology is now being forced into your life and actually you see how useful it is. I have countless examples of people I know in Europe, in France or in the UK that were, that were not used to using certain technologies and now are learning to use them, forced to use them and they start to see, well actually, you know what, maybe I'm gonna keep using it. I think at the very beginning of the discussion, uh, I don't remember if it was close or, or Norbert, but someone said, um, you know, we're not gonna go back fully to normal after this crisis. We're probably gonna keep doing some of those calls uh, online. And that I think is very interesting and is very true in many different aspects. Uh, and, and I think this is something which is, uh, which is very interesting. And it's also very true in, in, in South Korea. Uh, I was on another webinar uh, with the case of Grand Challenge yesterday. And I can see how now webinars are becoming a thing, which means that, as it was said again at the beginning, uh, this bridge we're all trying to create here between uh, countries is a lot easier now because people are available to think about these other countries. We have seen on our search engine uh, a lot more interest into China than before because when China was a country where, yeah, well, they're doing things, but it doesn't, it's not relevant to me. Now we're talking about China and we're saying, well, actually, uh, they've been fighting the virus in a certain way, which is interesting. South Korea is was not on the map. Like nobody cared about South Korea before. I mean, I at least it's what I've seen. Like, of course, everybody thinks about South Korea, but in terms of like, for example, investors, they're not looking at South Korean startups or not a lot. And through this crisis and the people seeing, well, actually South Korea is doing well, uh, what's happening, they're looking at a search engine, finding companies, they're like, well, actually, can you tell us more about what's happening in South Korea? And when I say we have, I don't know, 20,000 companies around doing incredible things. They're like, oh, really? So it's not just uh, Hyundai and Samsung. There's actually a lot of other small companies. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of them and they're doing incredible things. And you should definitely talk to them. And some of them have products in English and sometimes you don't even know it's a Korean company. So I think that what we're seeing is, is, is that things are connecting, people are being more aware and technology is being forced into our lives. Which is, uh, which is, I think, quite interesting. Wow. Well, th thank you very much for your answer, Jordan. And that kind of that makes me really happy that kind of all of you answered your questions in a positive note. Because one of the biggest worries that I had was that we will be saying like, "Oh my God, this is like the end of the startup world and uh, the technology and everything, and we're doomed." But apparently, we are all optimists and we're full of hope for the future. Uh, Klaus, kind of talking about hope, as you know, one of the most important things for startups is getting funding. Uh, how has that changed? You kind of mentioned it briefly in your previous response, but how has this changed during the uh, COVID-19 and how do you think will the investors now look at startups? Uh, will they look at them differently? Will they evaluate them differently? Will they be looking for different things that they had before? Yeah, excellent question. So. A few observations. So yesterday I was talking to 500 startups in the U.S. and also plug and play. And, and basically so the attitude in our discussion was a little bit a wait and see. So startup is under stress. You know, if there's a deal as an investor, I'm just going to sit and see, you know, what will happen to that startup. So if it's strong enough, it will be there still in a while. And then I put my money in. So, so it's a little bit like wait and see attitude. It's of course very stressful for the founders. But what I find amazing, this is the first time that I see that governments are creating dedicated vehicles to bail out or help startups. Bailout is the wrong word, sorry for that. Help startups. So like Singapore just came out with a $285 million fund available to any startup one-on-one -on -one matching, right, um, to basically help them in the crisis if they can't find regular funding right now. Germany came out with similar measures. I don't know other countries, I'm sure there are many, but the point is, I think it's the first time in, in let's say my history, I'm aware that a government would actually try to support startup ecosystem, the innovation which comes out of it, even to the point that they fund the startups in an emergency mode, which we kind of need right now, right? So 
So that means for me a few things. Number one, I think most governments have realized that the startup ecosystem is an innovation source which you cannot deny and you shouldn't, let's say, stop, right? The smart thing is to keep it going, right? So I think that is one key and, and the, let's say it's a source of employment already, which is also different to 10 years ago. I mean, when we talk about last crisis, financial crisis and so on, I think nowadays the, the startup ecosystem is a real source of employment in many countries. It's a source of innovation. It's definitely a few on the future and governments have realized that and that's why I'm optimistic that the funding will not be the problem, right? It, it will sort itself out. If you have a good idea, you solve a real problem, you have a good team, you'll get the money even now. That's my view. That, oh, well, that brings a lot of hope to, to us uh, in the future. But I have a question for Norbert. Uh, Norbert, in the current times, uh, when it comes to uh, tech communities like uh, to uh, Tokyo FinTech and in a sense also Seoul Startups, how has our role changed? Has it changed? And how, what can we do as a community to support the ecosystem better? Before I get to that, allow me to, to comment on what Klaus said and maybe introduce a bit of controversy here. We're, we're hugging each other and we're all in agreement. We'll need, need to create a bit of excitement because I'm, I'm probably a bit more of a pure cap capitalist in, in that way. And I don't fancy at all what's going on in the world right now with bailouts or support schemes of many different flavors. And right, that starts in the US where you push money into airlines that have been buying stock back for the last six years and right have bad cash management and risk management policies, as has German Lufthansa, which just got 5 billion or so from the German government, right? It, to some extent, we, we have learned from the financial crisis 2008 that the government can print that money and it, it's really created the safety net and uh, I think invalidated what capitalism is about and we, we actually should let some of these companies go bankrupt whether they are big ones or small ones doesn't matter and so also for startups I don't think you can claim on the on the one side you want to be the next Bill Gates or Elon Musk and become a billionaire and then the crisis hits and let's face it many of the the founders that we have today right in the even if they are in the 25 to 30 year old bucket they haven't really experienced a big crisis yet. Klaus and I have some gray hair to show for the the crisis that we have been through and that that's like uh, Russian currency crisis, Asian currency crisis, internet bubble bursting, 9-11, right? Next financial crisis, Euro crisis, etc. cetera. Um, it's just another thing in, in that regard. And you've got a playbook how to deal with it. And I, I think part of entrepreneurship is letting companies fail. And so I, I find, I agree with this, this, this sentiment that it's much more source of employment and especially in countries right like Japan and Germany that are SME dominated that that is ultimately where the workforce resides so you need to support some of it but I'm, I'm not really warm and fuzzy about that sorry um, just had to get this off my chest um, you ask about our our role um, I, I think the the importance of a connector uh, between ecosystem, and we touched upon that, I think, in some comments before that, uh, right, we, we played, I think, a very domestic role, let's say, although we have 20 international corporations with like so startups and, and others where we exchange ideas, where we uh, exchange startups when they, when they come here, etc. But from a focus of where we where we see our audience, I think it was much more a domestic focused. While I, I think this is my fourth event in the last two weeks where we do something across borders and really connect the ecosystems and the relationships that we built here, if you can leverage them towards 
our members, quote unquote, right? We don't have formal like company membership, but if somebody came and said like, I want to evaluate the Korean markets, like I can point them to a few people. Um, I, I think we can clearly help in, in that regard. Uh, I think we can help in our experience, what it means to work through a crisis, right? This, if, you, if you've done this four or five times in your life, then it, it feels a bit different. Uh, than the, the first such shock. And um, I, I don't think that we're fully through this yet. And I, and I don't necessarily mean the second wave, right, which might or might not come. I'm, I have no insights into that. But we shut down whole economies for eight to 12 weeks. And we have many SMEs that might, might still make it through the next two or three months but ultimately um, kind of will fall off and get bankrupt. And uh, it's hard to foresee what additional shock that might bring to the financial system and the economy overall. Um, I, I, I don't want to declare victory too early, both on uh, fighting the pandemic as well as the economic recovery just yet. I think we'll, we'll have still see um, some hardship coming our way that no doubt, right, we'll all navigate, but uh, I'd, I'd rather wish it was the middle of 2021 already. Yeah, well, we still have six months to go, unfortunately. Um, to kind of to wrap up the discussion and before opening the floor to the questions from our attendees, I would uh, I have one question that maybe is not necessarily to do with COVID. Uh, it so happens, and believe me, that was not intentional, that we have three Europeans living in three different uh, Asian countries, which it's, um, well, actually including myself, actually that's four uh, as well, although uh, I am together with Jordan in Korea. And I would like to ask your perspectives on uh, doing business in your particular regions and uh, why you think these regions are great to be at as a startup, as a tech company, and what are the next trends that are going to happen in that specific region that we should be on the lookout for. So maybe first from Jordan, because I don't think he has gone first yet. So you go, Jordan. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I have lots of uh, uh, things that I'd like to also say on, on, the, on these funding questions, and, and, but I think I'll, uh, I'll skip, and if there's a discussion, I'll be very happy to, uh, to go on that. Um, on, the, on the question that, that, that you're asking uh, in, in basically living in another country and, and, and doing things, I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's difficult for me not to be biased because this is why NR2 exists. Uh, the reason why we created this company, so it, it came out when I was actually living in, in China. Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, director of an investment fund uh, in Beijing, helping European tech companies enter the Chinese market. Uh, and, and what I realized at the time was that actually uh, so many things happen in China that nobody else is aware of that we need to find a way to connect things together because even though uh, there, we say we're in a globalized world, actually a lot of ecosystems are very, very local. And so um, I met my co-founder at the time, he was also in Beijing and, and we basically had the same view from different uh, angles and we thought, you know what, let's just try and solve this problem. And we went about it through, through data and through creating a search engine and um, and I think that, you know, I write this newsletter every week where I see there's like, I think about a hundred fundraising I share every week in China only. Uh, I'm not even talking about the other countries. And, and living in these different countries, you see how being on the ground in a local ecosystem, you understand things that you want to share with everybody. You want to you wanna help these companies thrive internationally. You want investors out, outside of these, these ecosystems know about them so that they can invest. And basically you want to fluidify the ecosystem. So we're trying to do that. Uh, the reason why we're in South Korea is, is, is for this exact very reason is if you think of South Korea and, and you can play the game in, in Europe, 
you ask people, well, what do you know about the solar sparring ecosystems? How many companies do they have? What kind of company? If people give you companies which are not Samsung and Hyundai, you, you'll be very lucky. It's, it's like, it's, you know, like there's very, even like Coupon, which is a huge company here. Um, it, it's, we use it, uh, I mean, I use it a lot, probably too much, but basically <laughs> other people use it a lot. And the thing is, it, nobody knows about this company in Europe. I mean, very few people, the, the ones that are really experts and they have, are they sophisticated about innovation, they might know, but they, they probably, a lot of people don't. And, and so these ecosystems are, are local, which means that you have to spend time in them to really understand them. But when you do, you can then share. And I think that's what we're all doing. And so for me, doing business in another country is all about uh, learning, being very humble that I am in South Korea and the reality is I've been here for six months. I don't understand anything. I'm just, uh, I'm just learning. I'm just, I'm just interacting with other people. I, I, I go to, there's a street in Gangnam where there is entrepreneurs everywhere. I just like to go and work in cafes there just to randomly meet people and try to understand what they're doing, what's their story, uh, what kind of companies they're creating. Uh, you know, offices is the same. And I think it's all about learning, trying to understand how local ecosystems work so that then you can connect them uh, globally. And I think that history has shown that, uh, maybe you guys know the, the theory of black swan, which says that um, uh, uh, an innovative event is usually impossible to predict. Something's going to appear in the world and there's no way you can predict that. You just have to adapt to it. Well, actually, if you look at the world right now, uh, this is very true and I buy in this theory a lot. But if you think about the world as, a, as one place, actually, you can predict the diffusion of these black swan events uh, in the world. There's so many examples of like, a company like Ofo, which is a bike sharing company that appeared in China and, and was a real black swan. It was impossible to predict that or people who did that, they were very, very good. And then actually there's another company in the US from a Chinese expatriates that was created, it's called Lime, which we now have, have everywhere. And so if you cannot actually predict Ofo, you can probably predict Lime if you're aware of what's happening in the world. And so, I think that that's the reason why we exist. We're trying to help people see that. And I think that living in these different ecosystems is, is the best way to uh, realize that there's a lot you don't know and there's a lot you have to learn and, and basically just do that and then share with more people. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Jordan, uh, for, for that, that insight. Um, how about Klaus? Like, uh, what, what what is it like to be as a, a Westerner in, in the, the specific Asian region? And what are the next uh, big trends that you will be observing in specifically Southeast Asia, but also other regions that your uh, German accelerator is active in? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean, for me, for me as an individual, a little bit like your st story, Marta. So I came, I came to Asia in the eight is the first time and I, I just explored this very different world right different to America different to Germany and it just fascinated me and that fascination has never left me until today I, I, I see a lot of entrepreneurial spirit uh, on the smallest to the biggest scale when I walk through the streets in Manila or in Jakarta right or in Bangkok or, or wherever right so and and I think that is that is what kind of kept me here, right? So I, I find um, this is obviously, I mean, we are all living in the future region of the world, which will eventually demo, uh, dominate, right? I mean, Asia, Asia and the 21st century that belongs together, right? So, so we are in the right place. And I think the startups who come out here, I mean, for us as an accelerator, um, obviously, we want to help them to enter these markets. And I go very much with Jordan. Um, you have to live in a place to understand it, right? I mean, I was living in the Philippines many years ago and I did not understand what I was doing for a very long time, right? So you, it, it's not easy. I mean, what you see is not necessarily what you get, right? The subtle messages in these cultures, right? So they are complex and to, to get them, takes time right so you need to be there 
That's what we try to tell our startups, right? This is also one reason why I don't believe that a virtual thing will work, right? I mean, we all have a role. Um, the organizations have a role like, like Tokyo FinTech and what you are doing, Marta. And I don't think that will go away, right? So to me, um, I think if anything, we will be needed more than ever because when you, when you look at the political landscape, which we sh maybe shouldn't talk about, but we have all this deglobalization and, and, and all these activities which are going on, driven partially uh, by governments and so on. Um, I don't believe in that, right? I think the world can only function if it comes closer together. And I believe startup ecosystems can be a catalyst to, to do this, right? To bring the world back together, regardless of what's going on in the big politics, right? So um, I'm happy, you know, that we are doing what we are doing. And I'm excited every day when I wake up. And I hope I can come to Korea soon and we shake hands and have a drink. Oh, that, that would be amazing. A little reunion here in Seoul. You, you as well, Norbert, we're so close yet so far right now. Uh, but since you've been in uh, Japan and in Asia for so long, like how has it changed uh, when it comes to the startup scene and the possibilities and the coming trends uh, in, in uh, not only Tokyo, not only FinTech, but in, in general, in the innovation scene? Well, that's a very multi-layered multi uh, question or, or answer to that question simply because um, there are so many differences uh, between the, the manufacturing sectors or the, let's say the hardware sectors and the um, services sectors. Um, there are differences between how Japanese companies, right, which are very global enterprises behave domestically versus how they behave internationally. And uh, it comes back to, I think, for somebody who doesn't understand Asia, or doesn't understand Japan, comes here for the first time, and our role is to help navigate all of that complexity a bit. It's clear that if you, if you sit in Europe or you sit in the US and you look at Asia, it's one blob. Uh, it's not one blob, it's multifaceted. Uh, China is different than Korea is different than Japan is different than ASEAN and anybody in ASEAN would say Singapore is different from Malaysia, Malaysia is different from Indonesia, etc. And so um, there, there are these unique differences and people who have been on the ground echoing what my co-panelists said before, uh, who've been on the ground and understand these nuances are much more effective in navigating this. And, I think if that's very helping. Um, I, I, I just think if you look at Japan, um, to come back to your question, the, the typical Japanese companies produces something, right? It's, um, and uh, I, I had a podcast recently where, where a professor from university described it as a simple process. That means not necessarily the manufacturing process is simple, but um, you, you figure out something physically that you want to produce, you design it, and there's an output that you pre bring to market, which is very different from the world that we find ourselves in today, where so many things are purely digital. And uh, I, I don't think, and not Japan specific, also many European countries haven't really made that switch yet, and the opportunity on the purely digital side um, or the combination of physical and digital is a unique opportunity, huge opportunity for the next few years. And the, the marginal cost of digital services is zero. And so it will fundamentally change the playing field. And if you look at some financial services, you look at payments, you look at stock trading, but we're going already to a zero price. Um, and it's very difficult to compete in that field if you are dragged down by legacy assets. Wow, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Norbert. Um, and yeah, it's, it was a complex question with a quite a complex answer, but you, you rocked it. I would like to 
uh, I have a lot of questions, but I would like to kind of start with the questions that our attendees have been asking. Um, so I'll start with the, the ones submitted to the Q&A box. And the first one is, uh, what new platform are you looking for now other than the virtual or online platform? How has it changed your business model and what strategy are you now looking to keep your startup afloat? What about for those who have had their business for decades? How has the current condition impacted your business? So uh, I guess we kind of already answered that question, but uh, for Jordan, is, is there any tools, online tools or uh, online platforms that you can recommend for our uh, attendees, for our community to check in and use to make their businesses more efficient during these times? Uh, I mean that that's a <clears throat> that's a difficult question because I think that uh, tools need to be at the service of whoever is using it, and so therefore uh, they're going to be very different from very different people. Uh, the, the way we go about that as a as a startup is we have to be extremely efficient with our time. So that means that we will uh, try and have as lead, like, ha just not a lot of tools. We just want to have as the smallest number that we can have. Uh, so that we can, we know where the information is and we go about that uh, in a very efficient way. So that for us means that we have two sets of tools. One set is for uh, uh, very technical things. So I don't know to which extent it's going to be interesting for, uh, for people, but like, let's say things like GitLab or things that allow uh, developers to, to work on the same things at a distance while keeping everything synchronized in a way which is very reliable. So that's something that we do, uh, which is very important what we, to how we work. And then um, there is the operation tool that we use. Uh, for us, we're using Microsoft. So that means that uh, they have versions of many things included in their uh, subscription. So I know people use Slack, for example, which I also use, for example, for Soul Startup, where I communicate with people and I love it. Uh, as for our internal tools, because Microsoft has something called Teams, which is linked to the cloud service that we use, and also something called the Planner, which is a version of Trello uh, that a lot of people use in the startup industry. For us, we like to use, to keep it simple, and just use uh, everything that Microsoft provides so that everything is linked together, and it's very easy, and we don't have to think about anything. And so we just, um, we just make it uh, as simple as we can. And then we're open to everything that people use. So for our own things, when we have uh, calls, for example, we use also Teams, which uh, handles uh, video calls very well. But we also, of course, use Zoom whenever people want to use Zoom because that's something that we do. So I think it's a question of finding your efficiency balance uh, within your company because especially for startup, and I'm talking as, a, as, as someone that works uh, in a startup, is you really need to be efficient. So keep it as simple as you can, uh, and then just be open to use whatever other people use and be easy with technology so that you can adapt to whatever you need to adapt to talk to everybody. Uh, that, that, that's what I would say. Oh, thank you. Well, how about our two other uh, panelists? Are there any tools that you discovered over the last few months? Of on, on, I assume most of them would be online, but not necessarily that have uh, being a game changer for your business, but maybe also for your personal life. Okay, I'll come first. Maybe Norbert can think a little longer. Um, I, I first of all, I, I completely agree with Jordan. I think as a startup, and and I consider our organization startup like, um, you have to keep it simple. Um, sometimes, obviously, you have constraints, but on our end, I mean, we, we work with Google Docs um, for no specific reason, except they are all the same reasons than Jordan, right? So basically, you have the, you have the information in one place and all of it. Um, I also think it's, it's important. Sometimes your client forces you to use a certain environment, um, and then you have to be open to it. But to answer the question specifically, I think this, this COVID situation didn't really change the way how we use tools, right? We have used Zoom before, now we use it more. We use Slack, maybe now we use it more. We use our Google Doc environment or Google Drive environment. And, um, that I don't think has changed so for us. 
uh, it's the same. Uh, as a personal experience, I've been now confined at home for this is week number 12. Um, I definitely moved to online shopping. I think that is something I can confirm like most other people, right? So anything you can imagine from the fish, uh, which you can't find anymore, right? To whatever um, we online shop, right? So, I mean, that has changed, right? I think there is also personal change in behavior um, in, in that way. But as a company, I think tool-wise, it's the same than before. I never thought I would do an online sake tasting, but it just goes to the creativity that some of these entrepreneurs have, right? When bars are closed and you can't come to the bar, then the bar can come to you. And so there's a, there's a sake brewery and, and the sake bar here in Tokyo that teamed up. And the first event was still rather small, with 13 people attending. And right, the, the delivery services in Japan are just awesome. So uh, you, you basically get your selection of sake the, the day before. You get on a Zoom call and you have the brewer explain the sake and everybody can try it at home. Uh, the second event had more than 40 people and they might actually continue doing it because it was so successful and right, the, the brewery is not in the middle of Tokyo. So, so they actually get access to customers a directly which they've never done before unless you actually go and visit the brewery and you you generate like a, a multiple of the the revenue that's possible so uh, i just think the ingenuity of saying we'll, we'll do this we try this right what's the downside is fantastic it doesn't matter what the what the tool is it's like you just need to rely on human creativity so true, so true. And I kind of wish Korea had a bit, a bit more of a lockdown so we could actually experience that sort of services as well. I think we're a bit too spoiled by uh, having easy access to, to bars, the, even in the corona times. So dear participants, if you have questions, please raise your hand. In the meantime, let me go back to the questions submitted here in the Q&A box. We have a question specifically for Jordan. Um, you mentioned your startup has embraced remote work even before COVID-19. How do you build an innovative and inclusive company culture in a remote environment? Uh, that's a big question. Uh, and it is, a, it is a big question because I think that um, culture uh, for us is, is the way we go. This is the most important thing we have as a company. This is our biggest asset and this is... Uh, this is why we can do what we do. So it is a very big challenge to do that. Um, we have had uh, times when we all met in the same place. We spent a lot of time together. We have, we're talking together all the time. Uh, we are a team which is uh, very caring and very aware of the other people. And so that means that we talk every day. So every day we have a we have a call with the with the team where we talk about things that are work related. Obviously, uh, and we try to be efficient, but we always leave time to discussing things that are not work related. We share with each other um, things about our lives. Uh, if if something happens in Korea which is fun, or uh, we, we I just share with them. Uh, we send photos to each other. It's a it's it's very specific and it's difficult to answer the question because I think culture is is very um, unique to each startup and the only way it works is if you have your own culture and if you own it uh, and so for us it's been a it's been a process where uh, we have spent time together in different places we have gathered everybody's traveled. Uh, we've been to, to uh, Europe, we've been to Asia, uh, most people have, have met uh, and, and so we know each other very well. It's, there's a lot of talking. Basically the, the key is communication and making sure that uh, you, 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 you talk about everything. So when you work remotely, one of the big challenges that you have is that you cannot see people, which means that sometimes when you're on the phone, it's very difficult for you to uh, do what you usually do as a human being, which is try to read through body language, uh, how people uh, look like, are they tired, are they, uh, you know, a bit depressed today, uh, anything. So 
the way we go about this is we make sure that we always uh, care about each other. So when we talk, it's like, okay, how are you? And we mean this question. We want to know how people are. And, and, and we really listen and we ask questions. And we make sure that there is a trust between us, which is so strong that we feel comfortable saying everything we need to say. And, and, and we know that people will take nothing personally and they will just, you know, we, we share a lot and we communicate. So that was a very long answer to a very short question, but that's because I think culture is, is really the most important thing you have in a company, uh, at least of our size. And uh, if I were to summarize uh, my answer, I'd say communication is the key. You have to over communicate when you're not in the same place. That's so, so, so true. And I would just, if I can jump on that with remote teams, uh, remote teams are a bit like online communities, which several startups is. And the important thing is kind of building the community culture around them, building community rituals uh, around that remote team, around that online culture and things that we kind of all agree to and aspire to. And like you said, over communicating is, is, is the only way around the whole hurdles that it, it, it brings along. We have been talking for some time, uh, but I would love to wrap up with just one question uh, for all of you, which is what three tips can you give to a startup or a tech uh, founder member now in these times? What are the three biggest tips on how to hack COVID-19 as a startup, as a fintech company, as an accelerator. How about we start from you, Klaus? Okay, um, I don't know if I can get to three, but I'll, I'll just start maybe with one and also make a long answer. So um, basically when you look back to history, right? So people like Churchill, they said, this is not the end, it's not the beginning it's perhaps the end of the beginning. So you have these cryptic messages, right? But, but for me, I think what we see is there's a new normal emerging, right? So I totally agree with Norbert also that I think the, the, life, the life 2021, I think will be different and we are not through this crisis and you know how countries react is very differently. When can we travel again? So now there's a travel corridor happening between Singapore and China, but I can't travel to Germany. And I asked the ambassador and nobody knows when I can again and all of it, right? So life is still complicated. It will stay complicated for quite some time. But nonetheless, I think we can see there's a new normal emerging somehow. So the, there is out of this fog, there comes a picture. And I believe life will not go back to what it was before. It will be different. I don't think life will be um, worse. I think it will be different, right? And I believe we just have to be optimistic about the future and run around with open eyes and, and try to see what we see. And I think then things will happen. And before we talked about bailouts and creative destruction, I think that's a very interesting discussion. Um, I also agree there with Norbert, I think using using government or taxpayers' money may not be the right thing to do. Um, my only point is, I mean, now they also use it for startups. In the past, they would use it for banks and many different, you know, organizations which may not have deserved it either. Now they pour it basically across the system, right? And, and I think it will help the system, um, but I also think companies will potentially disappear, startups will disappear. But new things will emerge, right? And, and I just think, you know, the future is interesting and we just need to be optimistic about it and that will do the trick. So stay positive. Um, how about you, Norbert? Uh, what are three tips or words of wisdom you would like to share with, uh, with the tech scene, the innovation scene here in Asia and beyond? Well, what do they say? It's like, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So hopefully it doesn't kill you. Um, but I've, I've done lots of interviews with startup founders and right there, there is some commonality in them where people say that nine out of 10 days are hard. Uh, it's like, if you're, if you're looking to be happy, don't become an entrepreneur, right? The, 
the moments of happiness and the, the glory are very short and the journey to get there is very, very long. So um, again, I, th I think it brings us back to what I, what I said earlier in terms of we had like a bull run that's been 10 years. Um, I think we got uh, used to exuberant markets and quite um, comfortable and accommodating uh, conditions, also in terms of the funding, who got funded, what type of business models got funded. And this brings us back a bit more to reality. Now, if you, right, hopefully you raise your funds, you have enough runway, you can right, adjust a bit your cost base and stretch it out. But from a macro perspective, if you look at when the most successful startups have been created, it's typically the year off or shortly after a crisis. So if you want to end on this with, with positive note, then the full expectation is that the vintage year 20, 2020, 2021 for startups will be an excellent one. <laughs> Well, just like good wine, eventually we'll look back upon these years fondly. Jordan, how about you? As a startup founder, what are three words of wisdom or, well, three phrases of wisdom you would like to share uh, with your colleagues and your community? I mean, I think that uh, um, what has been said is very true. Uh, uh, we are, as entrepreneurs, we're basically dealing with problems every day. So um, this comes at, uh, it's a big one, but it's, it's, it's our life to try and figure out solutions to problems. So uh, I think all entrepreneurs will, uh, will have that mindset. Now, we've actually written on, on, on what we think uh, the world's gonna look like uh, after all that's happening. And then if, yeah, I'll be happy to share with everybody who wants to read that. Uh, I think that basically the, the, the key is, um, is what I said at the very beginning, I would say, uh, being aware of the environment as a startup entrepreneur is very important anyway. So it's a question of really trying to understand what's happening in the world and what that means for whatever we're doing. So uh, it, it'd be silly right now to try to force what we're doing into what it was before the situation. It has to be something where the world is changing. Uh, people are having a different uh, approach to life. And so whatever you were building uh, is very likely to have to uh, be reshaped to these new users or clients or consumers that you have. And so as an entrepreneur, you have to ask yourself the question, uh, is what I'm doing coherent with the current, the new world? And if I'm taking a hit, uh, why and how can I actually change uh, what I'm doing so that actually I can benefit from the new situation because as i said there's so many companies who are actually striving through this crisis because they have the right business model at the right time so it's a question of thinking about that as a as a startup i think and and as usual putting a lot of intensity and energy into trying to solve the problem Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if there's no questions, and I don't see any questions from the audience right now, um, I would like to wrap up. Before uh, we do so, I would like to give a shout out to Klaus and German Accelerator, who are having a webinar of their own just after this. Um, there's a link in the chat if you're interested, and I've also posted it already on uh, Soul Startup Slack channel. So definitely check it out to hear more from, from uh, Klaus and his colleagues. Uh, another exciting thing. Um, thank you all of the, all three of you for joining us and sharing insights about different Asian markets, about different approaches, um, but also for kind of inspiring us with a little bit of hope for the future. I do personally look forward for us getting together and having that drink, uh, whether it be in Seoul, in Tokyo, or Manila, right, Klaus? I think it was Manila. Uh, so hopefully we will get together very soon to do so. And so our and our participants are more than uh, invited to join along the ride. So I wish you all uh, a pleasant evening. Um, and let's stay positive and let's let's not give up 
from 2020. It's going to be a bit, like Norbert said, it's going to be a good vintage year eventually. So thank you again, everyone. Good night. Have a good night. And hopefully see you soon. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Bye.